So for decades and decades, I would say this as an obstetrician and gynaecologist, I think it's been underfunded and underserved and so many of the topics that every woman in this room and every man in this room who has women that they love in their lives have experienced so frequently and so much of it is taboo. So one of the things I'm often saying to people is there is an inevitability in life about most women and girls having 12 periods a year for 40 years of their life. That is an everyday occurrence. It is so important to be talking about it and making sure that they can really optimise their lives going to school, going to college, going to work, carrying on with the caring responsibilities because if nothing else, they do represent 51% of the population and they're 49% of the workforce and they take over about two thirds, 65% of all the unpaid caring roles uh, in our society. And then there's another inevitability about women that has also, until very recently, and thanks to these fabulous women up here, has been completely taboo, and that is that they become menopausal. It happens for most women about the age of 50, for some a little bit earlier, and for some later. But it's been something that has really crippled our economy in all sorts of ways, and which only recently, and I would pay tribute to these ladies here, um, raising the bar not just in their workplaces, but um, as broadcasters and producers, we've actually really started to think about it. So what I'm hoping we're going to be able to do tonight is talk about what these fabulous women have contributed. They're going to tell us a little bit about what they do and why they are so passionate about improving women's health. And then I'm going to ask them how we're going to reset the dial towards menstrual health as well. So they've done a fantastic job on menopause, and they'll capture that for you in a moment. And then we're going to say, well, that other really important inevitability in a woman's life are all those periods. And so many times uh, I talk every, every, every week, in fact, to girls and to women who can't function because they've got painful or heavy or really difficult periods. And I think we've got to say that is the past tense now. We've got the wherewithal, we've got the research knowledge and we've got the drugs and we've got the procedures to put that behind us. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with the menopause because they've done such wonderful work and then I'm going to get them to tell us how we can rechange the focus and make, it, make the enthusiasm for menstrual health being a part of everyday conversation as they've done so successfully with the menopause. So who should we start with? Liz, would you like to give us a, give us a few moments? <laughs> the CEO of Seven Trent, who, as you know, <laughs> A wonderful, wonderful woman, and she's done so much in her working environment uh, to actually promote women's health and women's equity in the workplace. So, Liv, why did you do that? What, what was the story behind it? And, and um, share a little bit with the audience. So it's kind of fascinating, isn't it? As you said, 51% of the population are female, and yet and my, I've been a FTSE 100 chief exec now for nine years. There's never been more than five of us. We had a brief moment where there looked like there were going to be six or seven, but then a couple left. So <laughs> fundamentally, we've always ended up as this tiny population. And I always think that that means there's probably a bigger onus on us to make taboo subjects less taboo. And my mum was massively menopausal, like really like dangerously menopausal almost. <laughs> and, uh, and we laugh about it now, but she was like one of those women that just literally transformed overnight, almost had me by a microwave one day. Um, so that was quite visible to me as a child. Uh, my sister has massively struggled. I've definitely not had it as bad, but have begun early. So my mum began really early and my sister. So I think in our family runs. Uh, but when I began the work on it, it was 2017 and it was before anybody ever said the word. And I remember going out on a site visit and there was this lovely lady who'd worked for Seven Trent for about uh, 30 years, maybe 35 years, and she told me this awful story that she was working out in the field out and about and suddenly realised that actually her symptoms is that she had to go to the loo when she needed to go to the loo straight away. Mm. And she was in an active role working around sites. And there'd never been a setup for this and it had never been a problem or no one had ever called it. And I suspect it's a combination of maybe the two. And I was just struck by how little preparation we'd made. And yet we had a workforce that was already 29% female and increasing. 50% of the senior team was female, 60% of the board was female. And yet we'd never had a conversation ever about the menopause. 
And so we changed it. So from that day on, we insisted that every line manager went through menopause training. So you can't be a leader of people unless you attend the one day menopause training event. And we insisted that you should, as a minimum, get into conversation every week the word menopause so it's no longer taboo. So you have to somehow find a way during the course of the week. It's not, it's very easy for me. I can drop it in all the time as I get hot or whatever, but it's tricky for others. But the reality is it had to become common. So for me, it's personal. It is family orientated. It's as a leader. I want the very best talent. There's no doubt in my mind, women of a certain age have flocked to join the company because they know that we'll listen and we've given them their own passport. So everyone has their own workplace passport to be able to make adaptions to make sure it suits their life. And I think we've had better talent, loyaler talent, mm -hmm. and you know what? A more honest conversation. Less kind of like taboo subjects makes for less taboo subjects on a whole range of matters. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> I knew that they wouldn't disappoint. So, Davina, yes. come and tell us a little bit about your personal experience of women's health issues and, and what actually was the trigger that made you want to publish and broadcast about it? So I, um, I first realised that something was up in 2014. I was doing the Sport Relief Challenge and I was cycling, swimming and running from Edinburgh to London and having hot flushes and a period at the same time and sobbing relentlessly and having like a major breakdown all whilst being televised and felt like I was actually going mad and this had sort of been going on for a while but then eventually I thought I have to do something about this. I also um, ended up doing a TV show, it was live and I had literally just mentioned Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen's name who was standing right next to me and I went to go and say his name again and I looked at him and he's about the most recognisable, sort of famous, like, I've grown up. And I was like... <laughs> and, you know, it's live. I had to, and I just sort of was going, you, you, you're so... And I thought, my God, if I can't remember names and I can't do live television, what can I do? Like, I'm going to lose my job. What is going on? And the, the producer came up to me afterwards in my dressing room and said, are you OK? Like, she thought that was quite out of character for me. And I said, yeah, don't worry, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. And she shut the door and I just sobbed alone in this dressing room. I thought there's something wrong with me. I've got some kind of neurological illness. I've got Alzheimer's, what's going on? And this doctor said, OK, I think you need to go on HRT. I went on HRT and it changed my life. But I didn't tell anybody because I was so ashamed. I was, I was 43. I thought I'm much too young for this to happen. People aren't going to employ me in television anymore. My mm. friends are gonna think that I'm like old before my time. It was, I just carried this sort of burden of shame around with me. I want to reframe the way that society sees menopausal women, just like you, you know, realizing that midlife women are at the top of their game. They've been doing their job for 20 or 30 years. They really know what they're doing. They're probably really good at it by that point. Um, and they have so much to offer. And like we were talking about for the economy, you know, it's, it's enormous. You don't want to be losing doctors, nurses, teachers when they've got all that experience behind them. So I thought we've got to reframe the way we look at menopausal women for a start. And then my next thing was we've got to um, de-demonise HRT. It has, to, it has to change. We've got to reframe the way that women look at that. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to move on to Mariella next because she's also been broadcasting on this topic, but she's obviously got a, 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 an even wider interest in, in uh, women's health. So Mariella, what triggered it for you um, and what's, what's made you so passionate about continuing your broadcasting work um, about women's health issues? Um, well, uh, I think very, I mean, my story has lots of echoes of Davina's insofar as um, you know, I'd spent my, most of my career alongside my actual work, but campaigning on all kinds of women's issues. You know, I'm a feminist. I've always believed in the elevation of women and, you know, for society to create a woman-sized, uh, you know, shape in a, what's well, been a very patriarchal world. And at about the age of about 47, I started going through just the worst insomnia and anxiety. And I had no understanding of of what it was or why I was feeling like that. I would get on average like three hours sleep a night. You know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I didn't really have 
hot flushes at all, but I had this crippling insomnia and anxiety. And I went to about three or four doctors. They all went, oh, well, you know, maybe you need to take antidepressants. Maybe I said, I'm not, depre I'm not depressed. I just need to sleep. Um, and finally, I, I too went private and uh, went to see this woman gynecologist who was amazing. And I'd actually spent... I'd been to the, the final GP who'd done uh, these blood tests that they do to check where your horm hormone levels are. And the first one, and this is over the space of about four months, the first test said that I was post-menopausal. I was like, what? <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Uh, the second one said that I wasn't anywhere near menopausal. And the third one said I was perimenopausal. And so even the doctor just sort of sat there looking at me going, I don't really know, what do we do now? You know? and, um, and he said, I'm going to send you to this this female gynaecologist. And I sat down with her and after about 10 minutes of just talking and explaining the symptoms, she said, well, you're clearly in perimenopause and we're going to sort it out for you. You don't need to feel like that. At which point I did burst into tears because the relief was just so palpable. But it was, that was the triggering moment, really, because I, I thought after all these years and all of the issues that I've looked into and all of the trips to Africa and all of the stuff that I've done, how can I have... Sleep walk, slept walk into this absolutely unavoidable passage in our lives and known literally nothing about it. I mean, I was to say I was pig ignorant would be would be an understatement. And so I decided that I needed to find out more. And and as I delved into it further, I made a documentary for the BBC. And, and just discovered along the way so many lewd... I mean, like Davina, you know, I was terrified of HRT. I thought, I don't take HRT. I'll get breast cancer immediately, and then I'll be dead, and what am I going to do about my children? And then the insomnia got worse, and, you know... Um, and to discover how much of the mythology around menopause is totally perpetrated by total ignorance and the fact that there's been no research... Um, uh, put into it. The fact that, you know, a, a report came out in, in, in 2002, the 2012, the Women's Health uh, um, Report, that basically turned a whole generation of women away from HRT with no connecting, realistic, scientific evidence. And, and, and when you start delving into it like that, what you realise is there are so... I mean, I've got a genetic health condition, a uh, heart condition, um, inherited from my father, thank you very much, Dad. Um, and, and, and to discover that my symptoms for a heart attack would probably not be recognised. And to discover that there are so many areas of women's health that have just... You know, we've been treated very much as the sort of... Really as the spare rib, as the, as the, the, the kind of inferior prototype, the one that, you know, if we, if we give that medicine to men, then we'll just give you a little bit less because you're smaller. And, and, you know, there's no science to that and there's no sense to it. And, and so, you know, you asked why I'm still campaigning about it because I just think that there is so much that we still have to learn, so much that has to change. You know, you talk about menstrual health. I remember going into a supermarket to buy Lillettes when I was, you know, in my 20s and hiding them under the rest of my shopping and desperately hoping that no one would see that I had tampons in my bag. And when you think about it now, you know, with the benefit of maturity and confidence and, and all of those things, you just think, why on earth do so many women grow up with so much shame about what happens with our bodies in a perfectly natural cycle uh, of life? And it has to change. Like, it really has to change. It has to not just change a little bit. It needs to fundamentally, there needs to be a, a revolution. And, you know, I've got a daughter, so I want to make sure that her experience is completely different from my own. Thank you. Alex, uh, CEO of Channel 4, um, tell us what, what, where, where your interest in women's health came, because you've done an enormous amount, haven't you, with your workforce um, to inspire them to actually reach the top um, and do so um, openly and discussing what their issues are. Well, my, um, the Channel 4 women's group came to me in when I started as CEO, maybe 2017, and said that they thought the next important issue for women in the workplace was menopause. And I went like, really? <laughs> you know, is it? And they said yes. And then I was like, okay, tell me some more. And then when they explained to me that women were leaving the workforce in droves, so super qualified women 
who'd worked for a very long time, become expert in their career. Um, probably kids were kind of getting out of the house. Maybe they had other caring responsibilities. They felt in their lives that it was the time when maybe people weren't looking their way in quite the same way that they had been when they were younger. And that that was coinciding with a perfectly normal medical event, which made them think, actually, I can't work anymore. It's too much. The, com the complexity of their own lives when they should have had more time for themselves and more time, arguably, to do their job was coinciding with something that was so misunderstood that they were leaving the workforce and then finding, like, two or three years later that they'd lost their job and they could be working because they'd got through it. It made me really angry because it was completely unjust. And then when they talked about what a taboo it was, and I love a taboo, and Channel 4 is here to challenge things and say the unsayable, then I got really excited about it. So they came up with a menopause policy, and then they said, we were the first, sort of one of the very first employers to do it. Then they said, what we'll do is we'll publish this menopause policy, and it's really simple, the menopause policy, like, you can use your sick days when you're sick with the menopause. Uh, <laughs> your manager needs to know about it, like your team. Um, you can come in later if you want to, so you can avoid the rush hour if you're having a hot flush. And you can have a fan without filling in loads of paperwork for, with health and safety police. And um, also there's a cool room. I mean, it's like the simplest policy ever. You can use your sick days for when you're being sick. They said, if we publish that, Alex, and we use your picture on it, we'll get a lot more coverage. So I was like, oh, great, good. That yeah, sounds great. Yes, excellent. Let's put a press release out about that. But they did it in a very channelful way. It got a load of coverage. I realized we were onto something when a business HR policy then got coverage in Japan and Brazil and all these people were emailing in. And then we decided to make that freely available to loads of other companies and do talks about it. So that caused a sort of mass... Um, along with other companies, like lives a kind of mass interest from UK employers. And then we started doing the programs. So then, um, obviously, Mariella had her amazing program, and I knew her. And then Davina started doing programs for us. And that had a huge kind of snowball effect on HRT take up in this country, uh, which was fantastic. And then we've said, actually, much of this knowledge is knowledge that some women have, but is not shared with other women. Mm -hmm. And we're doing ourselves and men a disservice by not being able to talk about subjects that there is expertise among our community in because they're taboo or they're embarrassing or they haven't been talked about before. But we're not sharing knowledge because we're scared. Uh, we think it's inappropriate or we've been told it's inappropriate. So once we'd done the menopause taboo, I mean, you can't get away from talking about the menopause in my house or at Channel 4. Um, but then we started to talk about pregnancy loss mm -hmm. and um, making a pregnancy loss policy and particularly for people dealing with miscarriage or dealing with abortion and like being really clear about people being able to have time off and raise it as a health event um, with no judgment mm -hmm. around that, but having a buddy to return to work and sort of dealing with the complexity of that. That's such an unspoken thing amongst women. But again, it's a thing where women can help each other if they're given some structure to do it in. And then we start to talk about fertility and particularly fertility for younger women in the workplace in their 30s who don't have the knowledge. They just don't actually, they don't have shared knowledge. Many of you will recognize that picture. You know, you're, in one hand, you're reading about the Daily Mail that your eggs have all dried up because you've chosen to, like, do A-levels. And then on the other, <laughs> and on the other, and then school, correct. Well, that's what it sort of says, isn't it? I hope no one's here from the Daily Mail. Very good publication. And on the other hand, you're just desperately at school. All you seem to remember is how not to get pregnant, right? Yeah. So, so you sort of fear you're going to get pregnant every second. And by the time you do want to get pregnant, you're like, oh, my, how long was my cycle? And next, we're starting on, like, what's the period policy? How do we share that knowledge? How do we think about how that should be talked about in the workplace? So my coming at it is I don't like taboos. I don't like people being held back for things that are particularly, in this case, perfectly normal health events. And we have a big voice as Channel 4 because we're expected to say things that are different and we're expected to say things first so lots of people can follow so that's a very useful platform to have I'm so pleased that we've done things with the programs as well that have made a difference across the UK thank you so you see the sky's the limit every area of women's health we're going to tackle and that's why I think well-being of women has got such an important role in promoting education and advocacy as well. Now, I'm going on to our fifth panellist, Dame Jessica Ennis-Hill, who you will know, of course, as the gold medal Olympian, and who we've shared a platform on several occasions, haven't we, on Teams, or no, Zoom before, talking about menstrual problems and the challenges that athletes meet with dealing with something that, as I said before, happens 12 times a year for 40 years of their life. So, Jessica, thank you so much for coming um, and for all the work and support you've given us before. But tell the audience a little bit about 
the challenges that you met as a professional athlete and why you've now gone into um, tech to help women, who, both athletes and women who are not athletes, understand their menstrual cycles. Yeah, so I spent the majority of my life, as you said, as a professional athlete. And during that time, you know, you have to be so in tune with your body. You have to really understand those marginal gains. Is your nutrition right? Is your biomechanics right? Is, you know, your physio and everything that you're receiving to input into your body, is that all perfectly balanced? But the one area that was never, ever spoken about or really understood was your menstrual health as an athlete, unless you had lost your period or you were kind of in that spiral of, of you know, going out of control and not knowing what, were what was happening to your menstrual cycle. And it wasn't until the end of my career, where I had my son in the last two years of competing, that I really understood that actually, as a woman, hormonally, our bodies are so different to men, and that actually the effect that our hormones have on our body physically, but also mentally, is huge. And I think most women you know, we'll all say here that actually the first time we really become in tune with our hormones is when we want to get pregnant and we want to look into fertility and we want to understand our bodies better. And that was the time that I really kind of went, wow, I have all this, all these things going on with my body. I'm coming back to competing. I want to do another World Championships. I want to do another Olympics. But I'm learning so much I never knew about my body before. And I felt really kind of really lucky and really honoured to be in that situation with great people around me. I had great experts and great minds and great women who wanted to further their knowledge about menstrual health and hormonal health and pregnancy and postnatal within regards to sport. And after I had my children, I thought, actually, so many women out there don't have access to this information. You know, every woman should know that they have these four phases of their menstrual cycle. They should understand how their cycle changes from month to month and how those fluctuations have a massive impact on the symptoms that they experience and not just take it for, you know, this is what we expect. You know, I have a period every month and I'm going to get headaches. I'm going to feel bloated. I'm going to feel like this, but I'm expected to feel like this and I should accept it. I think actually more women should be have that kind of education and that understanding around what's happening so that they can take control of those monthly fluctuations. And there's so many lifestyle interventions that you can do through exercise, through nutrition, through yoga, through breath work, to really understand how to reduce some of those symptoms. And everything that I'm really passionate about at the moment and really supporting is how do we understand and educate more women about their bodies so that when they go through these major life stages like perimenopause or menopause or pregnancy, that they have this level of education and understanding of what to expect before they're kind of hit with this whole new life phase um, and they feel out of depth. So for me, menstrual health and hormonal understanding and awareness underpins every life stage. And I think it's something that we should start understanding more and educating more to more women from you know, the day they get their period all through those life stages through to menopause. And it's something that I've been working on yeah, for the past few years, really. Um, I think technology has advanced massively over the past few years, and I think we have a great platform to be able to enable more women to understand their menstrual health through technology. And that's what I'm doing at the moment with um, yeah, my app, which is pretty exciting. Thank you. I think what I'd like to really emphasise before we go on to ask our panellists a few other questions is how so much of women's health care is predictable. I told you about two things, menstruation and the menopause, but actually most of the other issues that women go and consult healthcare professionals about, they are predictable things and they're usually not ill when they're asking for that help. They are the rarity, the ill ones. They're usually asking to do maintenance therapy. They'll want to have screening to ensure they haven't got cervical cancer or precancerous cells. And they want to understand how to get pregnant or how to have the most trouble-free pregnancy, give their baby the best start in life. These are not illnesses. They are phases across this life course, which our panel have so beautifully um, laid out for us here. And then, of course, when I was trained, um, I won't tell you quite how long ago it was, but it was basically I was trained to work in a disease intervention service. You waited for girls and women to present as either an adolescent with problems or women in their reproductive years or women in their post-reproductive years. And I can also say that actually women after the age of 50 just disappeared from view. 
They just disappeared. Nobody knew anything about what happened to them until they came with a problem later on. And so I think what's so important is that we actually use that information, and particularly picking up on Jessica's point about educating women and giving them the information they need. Because in all those years I've sat in the gynaecology clinic, or in the obstetric clinic for that matter, what I've noticed is that if you spend time explaining to women what they need to do, surprise, surprise, they usually do it, and they don't even keep the information to themselves. They share it with almost everybody else in their lives. Their, their daughters, their sisters, their mums, the next door neighbour, the lady in Waitrose or Little, wherever you go shopping. Um, you know, they are incredibly good ambassadors. And what I'm asking everyone here tonight to think about is all the things that we could do to take all those inevitable, predictable problems and instead of waiting for them to be problems or issues, waiting for them to be problems, that we actually prevent so many of them because so much of that is possible these days. Now, when the Department of Health um, launched their campaign or their, their uh, public consultation, I think they were a little bit overwhelmed because I think they thought they'd get about 15, 10, 10 15,000 replies. They got over 100,000 responses from women in this country. And they got 400 written responses from healthcare professional organisations, rural colleges, all sorts of people who had a knowledge about women's health and issues. And they also then ran some focus groups, 11 focus groups, in fact, with women who came from very disadvantaged um, backgrounds who really have not got any form of equity. And I mention that word equity because we talk about equality, but actually we need it to be equitable. So there will be some women that I see in the clinic in Paddington who are able to access the information they need, and there are other women who really find it very difficult to read, let alone have computer literacy. And we've got to make sure that they have access to those facilities too. And we've got to think, and Jessica was talking about her, her tech and her app, we've got to think about the way we educate and we advocate for this. So there's no point me telling 10 and 15 year olds to go and read a sheet of A4. I mean, I've got a thing about A4 anyway, because it doesn't fit in your handbag. <laughs> so, I mean, so I reckon that you just leave it somewhere. But, you know, they want apps and they want TikTok. I mean, Nigat, who's with us here as an ambassador for well-being of women, her TikTok stuff goes viral. And can I just share with you, it's not Nigat who makes the TikTok videos. It's her boys, her teenage boys who do them for her. So we really need, and, that, and I mentioned that point, because we need, um, we need all the men in this room as well to realise how important it is, because saying that I say, something I say almost every day, is when we get it better for women, everybody in society mm. benefits. It's not just the women that get better, everybody else benefits. So, ladies, we've talked about um, the menopause, we've talked about menstrual health, we've talked about all the wonderful things that Alex has been um, championing um, at Channel 4 in terms of fertility and miscarriage. So, um, what do you think are the next stage steps for you, Davina? What, what do you, Davina, do, what do you think that you'd like to now focus on? I think that you've got some well, filming planned, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, what's funny is we just started filming today, actually, for you, Alex. Um, for a documentary for Channel 4 about the pill um, and that there are so many choices. I think somebody said today 71 different types of contraception that you can take. But it's funny when you, well, when I went to go and get on the pill when I was younger, I was just given a packet of microgynon and just told, just get on that. And I stayed on that for years. But I think what it is, is that we were expected to just stay on it because even feeling a bit down or a bit depressed or having a headache was better than getting pregnant. So let's just struggle a bit with that, but that's fine. For 20, 30 years, women would carry on with that. And the same thing, there's all the fear around it. Um, that, I mean, social media is terrible actually for spreading misinformation about the pill. One girl was terrified because she was coming off it because she thought she was immediately going to get ovarian cancer. She'd read it on TikTok. Um, that's not and, niggats and, and TikToks. And obviously, niggats, no, TikToks, are all, all, TikToks are all um, very, very but correct. The, but the big thing is, is that, you know, women are swayed by that. And when there is a scaremongering, you know, to come off HRT would have a, a direct impact on yourself and your family and everything. But to come off the pill and get pregnant, that has an impact on your entire life. Um, and, w you know, whatever course you decide to take, it has an, uh, an enormous impact on your life. So I'm hoping to just um, inform and educate, like you want to, Jessica, um, about contraception, all the different choices that women have, 
And in fact, that all women react. There is every single woman is different, and just in the same way that they react differently to HRT, they react differently to the pill, and that it is worth trying to get it right um, and to educate women in what ways they can do that. Thank you. Um, and I think you, you raise a very important point because you're talking about contraception and we often make the mistake, I think, of thinking that contraception is about preventing pregnancies. But of course, those tools that we use to prevent pregnancies are also the absolute keystone of managing menstrual problems and also helping with um, hormone replacement therapy to the menopausal woman. So it's not just about preventing pregnancies. And to come back to Alex's point, as you were saying earlier, you know, we, we were all taught not to get pregnant, but then, as you said, <laughs> I can't remember what your expression was, but then you suddenly, suddenly you're faced with, oh yes, that you had, you'd done A-levels, so that therefore you were going to have, uh, the rovers are going to dry up. Um, so that, that, and therefore we've got, I've got a whole cohorts of women who come to see me because they're in their 30s, they've put off late 30s and they've put off uh, becoming pregnant because they're trying to progress, they're terrified of their employer, mm. knows that they're going to, um, that they're going to try and get pregnant, they don't want them to know they need fertility treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we've got to find ways of adapting to this, haven't we? And ensuring that they can continue in the workplace, even if they do need time out. Mariella, um, daughters, we were talking about daughters, weren't we, earlier? And um, what do you think that you've learned that you've passed on to your daughters? And how do you think we can help them to understand and perhaps I should say not make the same mistakes we've all done? Well, passed on, my daughter puts her fingers in her ears every time I say menopause for a start. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think all of it boils down ultimately to education. You know, we, we set up menopause mandate, which I chair, uh, really because actually just beginning the conversation about, about menopause isn't enough. And, and really what needs to happen is it needs to be normalised in society. But actually, it's not the only thing. The whole of women's health journey needs to be normalised. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, what we're campaigning for with menopause mandate actually covers things like period health and contraception and all those things. I mean, a basic basic tenant of it should be that in every GP surgery in the country there should yes. be somebody who's trained in women's health. Yeah. I mean, why should we not expect that? We're 51% of the population, as we've talked about. And the idea that for many of us, you know, we talk about a postcode lottery to do with how your menopause is dealt with, but it's, it's exactly the same thing no matter what aspect of women's health you're going to the, to the GP with you're either going to get lucky and you're going to get an amazing person who's going to really help you and there are hundreds of thousands of them out there, or you're going to get someone who has no interest in women's health or no real understanding of it, and you're going to be palmed off and sent away. And so many, you know, I mean, what I don't want for my daughter is to go through, first and foremost, the shame that I think so many women of my generation have felt all our lives about everything to do with our bodies, whether it's your vagina smelling of fish, which was, you know, the thing that, you know, used to be hurled at you as a schoolgirl, and, and, you know, the shame about everything from below for your belly button down. And, and so I think that it's imperative that menstrual health gets talked about, that menopause gets talked about, and everything in between, and that is, really an educational thing and also I think that there needs to be an absolute resetting of the clock when it comes to I'm afraid training for GPs or we have to think of a different system where people do specialize I mean in America it works differently doesn't it because mm. you go to a knobs and gyne for, for women's health issues we haven't got a system that's set up like that so we need to have doctors who understand what they're talking about and you don't have people saying as they do you know this I said to a friend of mine just the other day she went to the doctor she said she wanted to go on HRT she was presenting menopausal symptoms and the doctor said I don't rate HRT you know and it's only because End of, story. of the story yeah I don't rate it you know and, and I said to her well did you say to him I'm afraid it was but I mean it could also just as easily be a, a female GP I said did you say you don't care whether he rates it or not you just want it you know and that's and I, I think you know the fact that we still think you know there is still a quandary for a lot of women and a worry about taking HRT and to be honest you know there are lots of things we still don't understand about it that we do need to understand but there's also you know we were talking about periods earlier um, and and you know I sort of said but what can women do because all my life I was just told well you know you've got period pain so yeah suck it up you know that's what comes with the fact that you can you can carry children but actually there are tons Tons and tons of things you can do now. I mean, it, 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 Leslie said to me earlier, well, you can take the Mirena Nicole. I said, but not until you've had a baby. She said, yes, you can. You know, and, and so there's so much ign ignorance. And, and, and that was the thing that struck me the most when I made the programme was just 
so many women coming up to me in darkened corners going, thank you. And I'm not saying that because I was flattered that they were saying thank you. I'm saying it because I was so shocked that they had to choose the darkened corners of public toilets and, you know, restaurants to, to say thank you for something that I shouldn't be having to be involved in imparting. Davina would prefer, I'm sure, not to have to be involved in imparting because actually it's something that should be so much a part of our normal lives that we shouldn't be making, you know, one-off programmes to let women know about what's happening with their bodies. It's insane that we're in the 21st century and that's still mm -hmm. the situation. So, Alex, you're commissioning so many of these important programmes, so... Your I know, I, we, we, when we started commissioning them, we thought, oh, well, that's what we should be doing because we're interested in it and it'll never rate. And now it turns out that lots of people are watching them, so that's good, isn't it? I think, though, it's partly because Marielle's point is about ignorance, right? Like, people don't have the knowledge. And, and your point about wanting to improve things as a health ambassador is about sharing the knowledge. Often ignorance stems from embarrassment mm -hmm. and shame and people feeling that these are things they're not allowed to talk about. In Cervical Cancer Awareness Week, a couple of weeks ago, in a very Channel 4 moment, we served throughout all the buildings vagina cupcakes with vaginas um, iced on them and with a little hey, leaflet. Four, <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with a little leaflet on everyone's desk <laughs> with quite graphic pictures of the vagina cupcakes saying, is it more embarrassing to eat one of these vagina cupcakes in the open plan office or to book yourself a smear test? Um, uh, because that's like an example of where fear and ignorance, what does a smear test involve? What will it really be? Is it really painful? Um, I can't do that stops women having a normal healthcare checkup. Mm -hmm. And actually, but by the time, I imagine everyone at Channel 4 has had one now because the leaflets for the cupcakes are everywhere. Um, but uh, that kind of thing is like also on us as broadcasters and as people mm -hmm. who are active in this area to think about how we remove the embarrassment and fear of discussing health issues. So I, I completely agree that we have to share the knowledge, but we also have to work together as employers and other people involved in the area to remove the fear and embarrassment of normal discussion. Viv, over to you, because you, you've done some marvellous things in, in really giving women that space, not just to talk about it, but also to change the way they're working, their, their pattern with you. Give us some more thoughts. So I, think, um, so I think menopause, certainly for us now, I think for lots of progressive organisations, feels like that's, that's a topic which has landed. I think so we're absolutely bang mm -hmm. on the money, I think, where you're going next, which is around, OK, let's go younger mm -hmm. and let's start the journey at a different age group. And I don't think it's just about employees, because most good, orga good organisations now have moved into that space. They're fantastic at some of the things that we're all talking about. I think, actually, the next phase for employers and followers in the room is to think about the hard to reach which means you've got to go community focused. Mm. So where we're taking it now is in our region, Midlands and over into Wales, there are 400,000 uh, young people who are not in employment education or training. And if you're not in employment educational training, then you're probably slightly lost to society. That means you almost certainly aren't getting access to either vagina cupcakes or to anything else that might appear <laughs> in the workplace. But you're not having these conversations either mm. in all likelihood mm. at schools, at colleges. And often they're people that are struggling most with period pains, with menstruation, with worrying about what they're going to do next in their lives, 18 to 24 year olds. And so that's but our next big project is to really work with that community and to try and help 100,000 of that community back into employment, educational training and along the way to do literally thousands of, um, of work experience or of different sessions. And as part of that journey to educate them in a little way about some of these topics. So I think actually it's got to become a community focused affair rather than an employee employer focused mm. affair. And I'm so glad you mentioned hard to reach because we've had a bit of a we've had a bit of a thing at the DH recently, and I said, why do we keep saying it they're hard to reach? And we've decided we're going to put that aside, that phrase, and we're going to instead say the people or the women in this country and the girls who are too easy to ignore. Oh, I love it. So I think that's really, it is a really important point because people are not hard to reach if you actually mm. choose to go and reach them mm. um, and you choose to make them have access to the information that they need to make the best decisions for themselves. So, Jessica, I've left you to last because you, you, you felt very strongly about the lack of research, didn't you, into menstrual health? And that's one of the reasons why we've been funding quite a few projects at Will, Will, Wellbeing of Women to look at uh, menstrual problems and how we can alleviate them. Yeah, I mean, it's been a huge eye-opener and it's been so fascinating to listen to you all talk about the menopause and just that whole education around it. But for me, to really kind of open up the door when I kind of started on this journey, trying to understand more about menstrual health and how that impacts on the way we move our bodies and that relationship there, it, 
it honestly blew my mind that there was this gender data gap and how big it was and that it affects so many women in so many different ways that most women don't really realise. So many of my friends have no idea that this is impacting on them and their lives and their daughters' lives in such a strong way. Um, so I'm really excited about this whole new movement to, to help in, like you say, break down the taboos and help more women and more girls talk about their menstrual cycle and their periods and also to kind of move that shift away from the negative connotations around it and the positive side you know there's so many great kind of relationships and impact that movement can have on your menstrual cycle to help you you know relieve some of those horrible symptoms that I spoke about before but actually understanding when to move your body in those right phases of your cycle is something that can be so empowering and give you such control as a woman um, and it's been really fascinating for me to delve into that whole area and yeah just really understand the lack of research that has been done and try and encourage more research and more funding and more time to be spent in this area. Um, it's just, yeah, it kind of still blows my mind to think about the gap, but I think every woman here today is just doing something incredible to kind of reduce that. And I think the more money and the more we talk about this area of women's health and the more attention it gets, then yeah, that gap will hopefully shrink. Thank you very much indeed. There's so much that can be done so easily. None of this is rocket science. It's actually very simple stuff. But what we've got to do, I think, is move away from that disease intervention service that I grew up in, and also the society in which we do things to people when they have problems. I think what we've got to do is to sort of hand the baton back to the women in this country, 51% of our population, to understand what they need to do to help themselves. It's not going to work every time, sure, and I, I appreciate that occasionally there will be illnesses that we need to help women with, but as I was saying earlier, for the vast majority of, of um, uh, events when women go and seek healthcare professionals' advice. They're not ill, they're trying to do maintenance things. So let's make it easy. And what I'd like everyone to think about is how wonderful if the girls in their lives could go to one place for one afternoon or even one whole day and get everything sorted out. Their mammogram and their smears and their period problems and their HRT and their urinary incontinence, we haven't even got onto that yet. <laughs> and all sorts of other things that are really very simple to sort out, but they need to go to one place. Why are we spending all this money funding healthcare facilities and making the women go around them? So I think we need to put women in the centre, wrap the services around them. Um, I'd like to thank our wonderful panellists. Thank you so much for your generosity of being here and your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs>